Welcome to the Lord's service as we come before the Lord in His name, in His word, and receive His very body and blood. I'm Dr. Harold Tomish from Concordia University, one of the newer members to Trinity, and my son-in-law, Dustin, is here, and we are serving. Pastor Mech is in Cincinnati today, uh, meeting Emily's uh, fiance's family while attending Packer game, and Pastor Verb is in Oconomowoc, where he will conduct the wedding of Blaine Andrada and Shvizen O'Donnell. Both will be back in the office tomorrow. I invite you to take your hymnal insert and turn to page 186 and just insert it there to be prepared for the Gloria today. Uh, we had Bible study this morning, but we continue with that series next week with God's Word to us, A Path to Discovery. Also, a new member class, Catechesis for Life, did not meet today, but it will begin anew next week at 9.30 in the music room. There is also an announcement for Usher Safety presentation on Tuesday, October the 12th at 6.30 p.m. in the sanctuary. There will be an usher training for safety presentation. All ushers are asked to attend. All members of the Board of Elders, the Board of, at the Christian Day School, Christian Church Council, as well as anyone interested in becoming an usher are invited to attend. Today we also have the special music of the children during the offertory, and we have the Trinity Music Center Preschool and Kindergarten children. They'll adorn our worship with praise as Jesus invites let the little children come and worship me. Having said that, we turn our hearts and voices to the worship of our Lord and Savior. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart, and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Please kneel for confession and absolution. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office, as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you, and in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, whose grace always precedes and follows us, help us to forsake all trust in earthly gain and to find in you our heavenly treasure. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament lesson for this, the 20th Sunday after Pentecost, is a word from the prophet Amos, the fifth chapter, beginning with verses 6 through 7 and 10 through 15. Seek the Lord and live, lest he break out like a fire in the house of Joseph, and it devour with none to quench it for Bethel. O you who turn justice to wormwood and cast down righteousness to the earth, they hate him who reproves in the gate, and they abhor him who speaks the truth. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and you exact taxes of grain from him, you have built houses out of hewn stone, but you shall not dwell in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink their, their wine. For I know how many are your transgressions and how great are your sins. You who afflicted the righteous, who take a bribe and turn aside the needy in the gate. Therefore, he who is prudent will keep silent in such a time, for it is an evil time. Seek good, not evil, that you may live, so that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you, as you have said. Hate evil and love good, and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle for this Sunday is a word from the book of Hebrews, the third chapter, beginning with verse 12. Take care, brothers, lest there be any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? To whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of their unbelief. This is the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter. As Jesus was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. 
This is the Gospel of the Lord. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty.
Our text for this morning's sermon is taken from the gospel lesson read a few moments ago with special emphasis on the following words. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? This is our text. You may be seated. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, what must I do to inherit eternal life? How shall I enter the kingdom of God? Or to put it in more contemporary speech, what must I do to be saved? Or what do I need to do so that I go to heaven when I die? It's a question you no doubt have asked yourself. Young people ask it, children ask it, older people contemplate it. And some of you may be thinking, well, yeah, pastor, that's why I'm here. Even people outside of the church find themselves asking this question. We all know that our life on this earth will end someday. For many of us, it will come sooner than we had hoped. And it's natural to wonder, what's next? What will happen to me when I die? How do I make sure that I go to heaven or inherit eternal life, as the man in our gospel lesson asks? What do I need to do to protect myself from going, again, from going to the other place? In today's gospel lesson, a man approaches Jesus with just this concern. And Jesus responds with words that hardly sound like good news. He comes, runs up, kneels at Jesus' feet. He is sincere in his question. He doesn't appear to be laying a trap for Jesus, as so often happens, but he wants to know, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus points the man to the law of God. You know the commandments, he says. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. Keep the commandments. That would be a good start. This should seem obvious. It is what the world relies on. I will go to heaven because I'm a good person, and I'm a good person because I keep the Ten Commandments. The man, too, replies that he has kept all of these commandments since the time he was a boy. But when you hear that, you think, really? Has he really kept the Ten Commandments? Obviously, we doubt his honesty here, or at least his ability to assess his own behavior in light of God's law. But I'm not even sure that that really matters. The man knows he still lacks something, That's why he's before Jesus asking the question. If he had perfectly kept the Ten Commandments, he would assume he's good to go. But here he is, kneeling before Jesus. Even if he's telling the truth, it is still not enough. But notice the commandments that Jesus tells the man to keep. They're all of the second table of the law. Those commandments that we typically number four through ten, which teach us how we ought to act toward one another. Jesus gets to the heart of the matter. He puts the very first commandment before this man. You lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. The man won't do it. He can't. He has great possessions, and he doesn't want to part with them. He wants to keep what he has, and who wouldn't? I can hear the objections and the questions that this man would ask, because I too have asked them when I read this text. Really? All of my possessions? Where's the line? Where will I sleep? What will I wear? What will my children eat? Does that include my glasses? How will I see? Surely living in Wisconsin, Jesus would allow me to keep a winter coat and hat and boots and mittens, wouldn't he? 
everything? Is this commandment for everyone? Or is it just for the man who approached Jesus that day? Please, please let it just be for the rich young man. Only him, not for me. For the man in today's gospel lesson, Jesus quickly shows him that money is his God and he can only follow one. Elsewhere, Jesus says you cannot serve both God and money. And this man has chosen money. But I think the real issue with this man is not actually his great wealth. Perhaps that's a self-serving way to wiggle my way off the hook and not have to sell everything I own. But it's not his possessions that keep him from inheriting eternal life. Even if he had given up all of his possessions, he would still fall short. It's not the wealth which causes the problem. One of modest means would surely have just as hard a time as this man. Even the young or the poor might struggle too. Giving up not what they have, but what they maybe one day hope to have. The question reveals his problem before Jesus ever replies. Did you catch it? It's kind of subtle. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do? This man's problem isn't that he has too much money. The man's problem is that he wants to earn his way in to the kingdom of God. He wants to earn it. He wants to, to do it himself. He wants to put God into his debt by the way he lives his life so that when he dies, he can say to God, you have to let me in. Look at how I lived. Even if this man had been poor, he would have gone away full of sorrow. He wants to save himself. Well, dear friends in Christ, we suffer this same problem. In fact, we're often troubled by this text and ones like it Not just because we don't want to give our stuff away. We're troubled because it offends our worldly sensibilities. We want to be in control of our lives. Or at least we want to keep that illusion going. We believe that if we work hard at something, there's nothing we can't achieve. That if we set our mind to it, anything can be done. But it doesn't work. Not here. If we're asking what we must do to inherit eternal life, then we're asking the wrong question. And when you ask the wrong question, don't be surprised when you don't like the answer you get. We can't do anything. Every every one of our efforts ultimately comes up short. The pericopes immediately preceding and following this text are actually quite revealing. We read one of them last Sunday here. Perhaps you'll remember, people were bringing little children to Jesus that he might bless them. And the disciples tried to stop this from going on. And Jesus replies with a rebuke for the disciples. Let the children come to me, do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. So then the question is, how do children enter God's kingdom? But an equally good question is, how did your children enter your home? Did they do anything to earn it? Hardly. How could they? They enter the world naked with nothing and no marketable skills whatsoever. All they know how to do is cry and cry and fill their diaper and eat. That's all you know how to do. And yet somebody welcomed you into their kingdom, their little, their little kingdom, their home. Not because of anything the baby could do or not do, but simply because they love that child, because it's their child. A baby can't earn his own way, but his parents welcome him into their home. A child cannot earn it. She cannot put her parents into her debt. No matter how cute her giggles and smiles have become, they're welcomed into the little kingdom of the home simply by virtue of being a child. It is all pure gift, pure grace, paid for by someone else, 
and given to the child for free. As it is in our home, so it is in the kingdom of God. We enter only by pure gift, by his grace, paid for by someone else, paid for by Jesus with his holy precious blood and his innocent suffering and death. Jesus gives to you that inheritance in your baptism. You're adopted to be God's sons and daughters, and everything he has, he gives to you. After the rich young man goes away sorrowful, the disciples immediately need a little time to debrief with Jesus. That was scary. That was a word maybe we didn't expect. But instead of walking it back, Jesus actually makes things worse. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, he says, than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples respond with amazement. Then who can be saved? And that's exactly the point. That's exactly Jesus' point. The disciples get it where the rich man doesn't. They know that it is impossible for them to be welcomed into God's kingdom, for them to inherit eternal life or be saved or go to heaven when they die. And that's exactly what Jesus would have them believe. That's exactly the point he's trying to drive home. He cannot do anything to inherit eternal life. It is impossible to earn it. It must be received as a gift. Jesus replies to his disciples' question, With man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. It is impossible for you to earn your way into the kingdom of God, but it is not impossible for God to give it to you. When Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, God didn't give them a list of commandments by which they could be saved. Instead, he gives them a promise that he will send a savior. The offspring of Eve will crush the serpent who led them into sin. If obedience to the law could save them, God surely would have done it that way. But they could never keep the law perfectly enough. And so God sends his son. I suppose the irony of the whole text is that Jesus does the very thing that he tells the rich man to do. He tells the rich man that in order to inherit eternal life, he needs to keep the commandments. And Jesus keeps the commandments perfectly for you. The letter of the law and the spirit of the law, every T is crossed, every I is dotted. And Jesus gives up everything he has, and he gives it to the poor. He gives it to you. To you and to me, he gives up all that he possesses, his righteousness and his holiness, and he gives it to you as a gift. Not because you did anything to earn it, because you can't. And so he gives it to you because he's your brother and he loves you. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, what must we do to inherit eternal life? Nothing. There is nothing you can do. Jesus has already done it. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord, to life everlasting. Amen. We continue with the prayer of the church. Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. O Lord, God of hosts, reveal our sin to us through your word. Do not let us dare to approach you in our own righteousness, but rather come before you in humbly in repentance that we may inherit eternal life by your grace in Christ alone. Lord, in your mercy, O Lord, God of hosts, keep us from hating those whom you send to reprove us with your law and from abhorring those who speak your truth to us, that we might repent and live. Lord, in your mercy, 
O Lord, God of hosts, sanctify us with your spirit, that we may hate evil and never pursue it, but instead love good and seek it always. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, God of hosts, let your favor be upon all who govern us in your stead. Establish the good works of their hands upon us, that we might live in peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, God of hosts, have pity on those in our congregation that we call upon your throne to heal, to help, to comfort. We pray for Steve, hospitalized with complications from ALS, for Deborah in management of illness, for Bernadette, sister to Tom, Sue, cousin to Beth, Jennifer, sister to Catherine, Sharon, sister-in-law to Laura, niece to Sue and Nancy, Pastor Timothy Klein, father of Paula, Joanne, Miriam, and all in cancer treatment. For Reverend John, sorry, Brian Banke, Robert Badke, Robert Holt, Austin Griesbach, Adam Robinson, Elizabeth Reisler, Darren Carlson, Nate Yeager, and Anthony Dombrinsky, serving our country in the military. For Don Schaefer, Dorothy Woffler, Frida Larson, and Carol Codiero, all in hospital care. For Ed, in palliative care. For Jenna, undergoing tests. And for Trinity members, families, and friends in our community with COVID-19. All your servants, afflicted in body and soul, satisfy them with your steadfast love in Christ and grant healing in accord with your perfect will. Lord, in your mercy, O Lord God of hosts, satisfy, satisfy the longing hearts, our longing hearts, with your steadfast love here in the feast of Christ's body and blood, that we may rejoice and be glad in you all the days into eternity. Lord, in your mercy, Lord, we pray for families who have suffered loss. Today, we give you thanks for the faith of B. Crox. We also pray for a family of an eighth grader who lost her father. We pray for the Fracas family and all your saints, O oh Lord, and we pray that you may comfort them with your word, that you will keep us steadfast to the end, Graciously keep us firm in the same faith, that in the end we may enter with them into your eternal rest. Lord, in your mercy, into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. We invite the children from Trinity Ministry Preschool and the kindergarten students to come forward and to sing for us.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you. Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death in the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in body and soul to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. 